Hello, everybody. How's it going? It's going well. Yeah. Hello. It's good. good evening. Good evening. This is the Calgary Folk Music Festival's Block Eater 7.0 presented by ATV. This is the kickoff of the festival. And before we begin, um, I would like to just acknowledge that we live, work, and play here in Mokitsis, the Blackfoot name for Calgary on Treaty 7 lands, on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. This includes the Siksika, the Pekanai, and Kanai nations, the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearsbore, and Wesley nations, as well as the Sukuna nation. Southern Alberta is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. This is an exciting conversation coming up. We are discussing Black history and arts with some of Canada's leading um, pioneering history makers in the industry right now. We have Leilani, who is also known as Rich Prophet by way of Toronto and Caldone. They were shortlisted for the 2020 Polaris Music Prize for the album uh, DNA Activation. We have uh, Brendan Gray from Super Duty Tough Work. Um, they were Winnipeg based and um, their sound has been labeled as golden era taste in a current era based world. They were long listed for the 2020 Polaris Music Prize for the album Grey Matters. We have Polaris Prize winner of 2021, Cadence Weapon, also known as Roly, Roly Pemberton, who won for the album Parallel Worlds, as well as Dorje the Singing Shaman, who is an emerging country musician, making her own way and changing attitudes and beliefs in the country music scene in Canada. My co-host tonight is Tomi Ajele of Afros in the City, which is the only media collective of its kind in Mokinsis that's dedicated to amplifying Black voices. It is so phenomenal to be in this group chat with you. Um, there's a lot to discuss. The world has changed dramatically in the last two years, and so much has gone on. Um, who wants to lead us in the discussion of the history that it's taken to get to this point? I want to jump in with really when we're thinking of this history, just kind of set set the stage and kind of set the question and just kind of hear from you all a little bit um, about your history, you know, and, and your journey to get to this point. And obviously a lot of our stories start before us, you know, and so whether whether you kind of want to speak from, um, you know, yeah, how you kind of see history in Canada and in your industry playing out to where you've gone today or whether you want to speak to your journey. Um, yeah, let's dive in. And I'm just going to start with based on how my screen looks. So um, Georgie, I'm going to pick on you to go first. Always got picked first in class too. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, thank you uh, so much for having me. It's um, uh, wonderful to be included on this platform with uh, incredible artists. And um, yeah, I uh, I live in and make my art in a Muscoachi, Wiscahakan, or so-called Edmonton uh, here on Treaty Six land. Um, important to obviously, I think, just acknowledge that in terms of historical reference of, um, you know, where I've lived and it really has been all over Treaty 6, uh, 7 and 8 in Alberta for the majority of my life. Um, I was raised by a single mom. Uh, my hometown is Irma, uh, which is a very uh, small little hamlet, um, an hour and a half outside of Edmonton. And uh, yeah, I grew up as a, a biracial kid on the prairies, um, lots of small towns. I was almost always the only uh, black person uh, in, in the schools that I attended. And um, yeah, in, in most things that I, uh, I, I navigated, um, I guess as a part of my history. I've always been uh, interested in the arts in general. My family is really, really musical on both sides. And, um, but I like, it was never something that I was gonna do uh, professionally or anything like that. Um, my life took a turn into uh, the healing arts and uh, energy medicine. Um, I've been a practicing shaman for almost 10 years now. Um, and uh, that's kind of what I thought my path was. 
And, and slowly as I got closer to 30 years old and at actually completing uh, my shamanic training, um, the music piece started kind of finding its way into themes in my life, uh, themes like through my own healing that I had to do as I was training to become a shaman. And, and I had that realization kind of at the tail end that um, there is actually song and, and, and lyrics and, and music inside of me that I wanted to share. Uh, and also for that to look and sound at my concept and idea of country music, which is, um, you know, the genre that I really grew up with that we, you know, we were taught how to line dance in, in, in school, uh, <laughs> you know, so um, that that's kind of was just a, a part of it. And uh, that also led me to really kind of sit down and, and, and understand the history of country music. And, uh, you know, I was able to fully discover the origins of country music, which is, I'm sure, no surprise to anyone here. Um, the origins are rooted with uh, Black people, enslaved people from uh, Africa and the Caribbean, bringing over traditional sounds and instruments, and that being the, the foundation of what country music is now. Um, so yeah, that's that's been my journey. I guess that's my history. So this is kind of answering the question uh, a little bit about my history. And uh, I just, through all of that, I finally just started uh, performing professionally and putting my music out there uh, four and a half years ago. Um, released my album, first project, uh, that November 2020, and, and had no expectation that I would be uh, received and and receive some of the exposure that I have. So. Amazing. Um, Roly, do you want to give us a little history on um, how it's come to be that you are the champion of words for 2021? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it was definitely, um, I, I had a similar upbringing, you know, coming from Edmonton to uh, Dorje where, you know, I was the only black person in elementary and junior high, and then it became high school and it was, you know, like five people, you know? I mean, it, it was interesting getting into the Canadian music scene um, initially because, you know, I look back to the, uh, you know, first times I would come to Toronto and it would be like, you know, I'd be like, I'm from Edmonton and people would be like, oh, where's that? Yeah. You know, it's like we're, a lot has changed since, you know, I first started, like, you know, I was nominated for the very first Polaris Prize in uh, 2005. And that year, it was a lot of white indie rock bands. And it was me and k -Non. And then, and I, I didn't win that year. And it felt like it was just like a total pipe dream, you know, for rap music to even be considered, like, seriously, you know? And then to look at, you know, the past few years, you know, seeing like Witch Prophet, you know, seeing backwash win, see me win this year, you know, it feels like it, also with just like dr drastically more um, diverse um, nominees. Like it's, you know, it, it's, it's really strange um, to have like survived this long in my career, even though I'm, I'm still like a young person. I started off, you know, as a teenager and, you know, kind of I've dealt with just like everything in the music industry in Canada, you know, like bad record deals with like indie labels with really um, well-meaning white folks um, to, you know, where I'm at today, where I'm, I'm just really proud to be able to be part of an event like this, you know, which I, I feel like is really just like a revolutionary act in and of itself. The fact that we're able to have this conversation and, you know, it's, you know, sanctioned by like a festival, you know, like that, that would have never happened in 2005. So um, I feel like that's kind of the short form of my story. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that for now. I just need to jump in because both of you have mentioned this and we have to talk about the prairies. Like we have to talk about growing up black on the prairies. So we will get there, but um, we'll circle back to that. So um, yeah, how about uh, which prophet? Can you hear a little bit about your history? Um, yeah, so I'm witch prophet. I immigrated to Canada when I was four, so like 1987 or something like that, um, from Kenya. My parents are Ethiopian and Eritrean. Uh, that's just a very broad thing because there's many layers to that, but I won't get into that. Um, 
came to Canada when I was four. We lived in Toronto all my life. Um, and I've, I started music with my family. So I come from a church family and every Sunday we'd go to my grandparents' house after church and all, and I come from a very large family, extended family. And so all the cousins would kind of be like shoved to the basement or to the backyard, like go do your thing until lunch is ready. And in those times we would, we started a band called the cousins band. And so it was me, my, my five other cousins, my sister, and my, my aunt, who was just a year older than my sister, so she was allowed to be a cousin. <laughs> um, so we'd, we'd make music and plays and perform them for my family and friends. And I've been doing that since I was like three. Um, when we were in Kenya, we were doing it. And then when we all immigrated to Canada, we continued the, uh, the um, family tradition. Um, I never thought music was a viable um, direction to go. Uh, it was never seen as like a, a good job with my, within my family or even within my culture. It's like, what do you mean music? That's not, you know, be a doctor, be a nurse, be an engineer, be anything other than artistic. Um, but I always dreamed that I wanted to be a singer and I, and I, always wrote songs. So I was like, this is just what it is. Um, I didn't actually start doing anything real until 2009. Um, when I started a collective, I, I have a son. So I got, I got pregnant when I was 18. And, uh, and I was with his father from when I was 18 until I was 25. Um, and then when we broke up, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm breaking out like everything. I'm not going to do anything that my parents said, like, I'm doing this music thing. It's now or never, you know, I've already spent this time, uh, you know, being the mom, being the like, you know, following everybody else's direction of what my life should be like, um, to like, you know, anyways, so I, I decided I'm going to start a collective with my friends. Um, we started a collective called 88 Days of Fortune, um, where we would do uh, events and live performances um, monthly throughout the city of Toronto. So at first it started as we're going to do a citywide tour and it's called it's going to be called 88 Days of Fortune, where we'll just tour the city for 88 days and perform at different venues. But after the third event, we realized the amount of people that were coming and the amount of artists that were like, how do we become a part of this collective or how do we get on the next show? We were like, no, this is not a tour now. This is going to be an actual event where we do, you know, every bi-monthly or monthly we'll do events and we'll provide this platform for um, musicians in Toronto who are not getting seen. Um, we also reached out to, we had, a, there, at the height of it, there was about 35 members. Um, it included acts like the Ubebe Gimme Moors, uh, myself, Witch Prophet, uh, KJ, um, Brendan Phillip, um, The Satisfaction, who is a band from Seattle. Uh, we were the first ones to bring them to Toronto, to Canada. Um, Latasha, who's like a huge rapper from LA or from New York, but now lives in LA. There's like a lot of people that we were doing music with. And so for like, 10 years, I was promoting and putting on shows and um, being a booker and just like being in the scene in Toronto and and booking acts that I really liked and being like, I want to create a, a culture in the city where it's like, we're going to we're going to promote each other. We're going to have access to um, to like assets where we could be like, here's a picture of me performing because it all started because I asked to perform somewhere and um, the guy running the show was like, well, have you performed anywhere before? Do you have anything recorded? Mm -hmm. And I was like, no. <laughs> he was like, well, get that and come back to me. And instead I was like, uh, I'm going to get that and I'm going to stay where I got it, which is created with the community that I, that I did it with. So, um, yeah. And then I released my first solo album in 2018 called uh, The Golden Octave. 
Um, and then I released my second album in 2020 called DNA Activation, where it focuses on um, my ancestry, um, my heritage, my family, and it's like an Ethio soul jazz album. Um, but yeah, so my, my history is just trying to create space for queer people, for women of color, for black women, um, for our allies within hip hop, R&B and soul. Um, and since I was based in Toronto, it mostly was in Toronto. That's the short form of everything that I just said. I could have said it that short, <laughs> but I didn't get that until I finished what I was saying. So, yeah. That's history. That's history. Um, Brandon, do you want to walk us on the journey of Super Duty Tough Work? Sure. I mean, in short, you know, uh, I'm originally from Ottawa. I grew up in Europe and I moved to Winnipeg to for one year to attend <laughs> university, which turned into more than 10 years, okay? <laughs> um, with some travel in between. And I mean, I'm a, I come from a musical family. You know, I'm a musician by trade. Both my parents play. My grandmother played, her mother played, um, my uncle. You know what I mean? I'm a, Winifred Atwell is my grandfather's cousin. Um, so I come from a very musical family. And yeah, I worked in the Winnipeg scene just as a side player. Like drums is my main instrument. So I did a lot of, um, yeah, just work as a side man and, you know, events and that sort of thing. And, you know, so right before I came to Winnipeg, I was doing a lot of like band work. But when I moved to Winnipeg, I was, you know, basically by myself. So I was like, well, I don't, have anyone to link up with to form a band. So I'm going to focus on, on my rap career. You know what I mean? Which was interesting. And basically after being a part of lots of different groups, I never came to fruition. You know, we formed Super Duty and then we did a few years of just like throwing parties. And then we put out a record and yeah, and I'm here with all of you. So that is the nutshell story of my journey. How does it feel, really, to be recognized um, by the Polaris Music Prize? Um, like, and this is, you know, third time, but to finally like hold that title, um, what does that say about um, the journey and where we are now? Yeah, you know, um, you know, it makes me really proud, you know, just because of you know, where, where my career kind of started and just like all the things I've been through in my career too, like dealing with, you know, like being on labels that collapsed and, you know, just kind of dealing with, uh, you know, when I first started out, it was, it was still at a time when in Canada rap was really not respected at all. You know, like we, we had our heritage and stuff, you know, where it's like, yeah, when I was growing up, you know, you see like Northern Touch on TV, you know, you, we had like kind of the old school stuff, but at, at that moment, it was still like a pre-Drake moment, you know, and I, that still required me when I would go and play in the States, people would like the idea of a Canadian rapper was like very foreign still, you know? So to come from that point to get to the point where I win Polaris, it's, it's really, um, it was actually very empowering, just especially because of the album that I won for in particular, where I'm talking about these themes, you know, that, um, you know, I, I really was, greatly uh, inspired by um, the George Floyd protests. You know, that was like the thing that really drove me to make the album uh, Parallel World what it was, you know, just like seeing that kind of collective movement and, and also seeing like the media's response where they would actually talk about these things that I always knew were there, you know, like microaggressions or, you know, um, institutional racism. Like it, it, it was just like, I was like, this is my time. Like, I really need to speak to these issues. You know, like, I, I really, it really, I felt this urgency to really, like, I want to, like, like, I got to hit this right now, you know, and, and just really be as open and, like, um, truthful about it as possible, you know, and people really resonated with that in, in, in a way that I, I didn't, like, totally expect, you know, because it's like, I don't know, every other time I've just done what really came to my heart, you know, it didn't really... Uh, work <laughs> or something, you know, like, so I'm, I'm blown away by, you know, what it's done for my career already. Like, it's just, it feels like now I, I'm, I'm 
you know, I've been around for a while and now I feel like I've, I've got this kind of uh, elder statesman vibe to me now, even though I'm still, I'm still, I'm not that old, but, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, people kind of like look to me like I'm like the Oracle now. It's like, it's like, wow, he won. It's possible, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I was going to say you hit the zeitgeist with your album. You're on point with what the, what the world was thinking about. That's why it like hit a, it hit the right nerve. Thank you. Yeah. I actually never did that before. So <laughs> it, it, it goes, I guess it worked, you know? Um, Brendan, um, you have a super rich sound. Um, it pulls from, from influences from, from jazz, from hip hop, your sampling, um, you know, tell us about the journey of actually creating this body of work. I mean, <clears throat> so for anyone that's watching that doesn't know, you know, Super Duty Tough Work is, you know, an ensemble of musicians. And in my mind, the goal, although it is live instruments, is to sound like it was created with an MPC or a whatever, SP404 or whatever your machine of choice is, okay? So that's kind of important to me. Um, and that was one of the driving forces behind the formation of the group and then what you hear on the record. So yeah, that, that's that's the, the driving force be, behind the sound that you hear, you know? And in addition, as you said, golden era, you know, taste, current era bass. So we're just real influenced by by the tradition of, I mean, so many things, but specifically, I guess, in this case, you know, hip hop and um, black American resistance themes. And that is that sound. Love it. Um, Witch Prophet, you are, it, it's, it's a soulful album. It's ethereal. There's a lot of magic in your album. Um, you collaborate with your partner, who is also a multifaceted artist. Um, talk to us about the journey of DNA activation and um, how the power of collaboration really came through in the album. Um, yeah, so DNA activation, I actually, that was, it was supposed to be my first release. Um, and I had applied for a bunch of grants, uh, like Toronto Arts Council, Ontario Arts Council, and things like that. And when I pitched it, I was like, this is it. This is, I'm hitting the zeitgeist. <laughs> I was like, I'm hitting it. Everybody's talking about uh, immigration, family, ancestry. That's what the world is about. And it wasn't. So, <laughs> but like, and I didn't get the grants. And I was like, oh my God, this is the worst idea. I totally like did the opposite of like what, you know, which most artists do is like when you get rejection, you, you doubt yourself, right? Um, and so I got the rejection letter and was like, oh, okay, then I'm, I'm, this isn't the right idea. Um, I'm not gonna do this album. And then I released The Golden Octave, was, which was really just a collection of songs that ha I had written a long time ago that didn't have any beats to them that I finally found some beats and was like, fine, and just kind of released it to do it. Because um, I was also like, if I die it, right now, I will regret that I never did this because this is what I wanted to do. So just release it. Um, and also my wife is, my wife, Sun Sun, who's also my producer is like, was the number one person who was like, you need to stop um, talking about it and just do one thing one step at a time because I was seeing it as this like huge project which had which had all these things that I was like oh there's so many ideas and, and, uh, and then I was getting overwhelmed with it and then the rejection came and I was like it's wrong and she was like no it's not wrong we just have to actually sit down and take a moment um so I released the golden octave instead and then I got like, you know, uh, people being like, this is great and writers writing about it. And I got sync, like a bunch of syncs for the songs on it. And I was like, oh, I, this actually can make money. I was just doing this because of my fear of death. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I should actually, hey, maybe I can, I can really do this. So um, um, when it came down to like, okay, I want to release another album. I was like, this is, this is it regardless of if I get a grant or not. I want to be able to write a song, write music 
that honors my family, that challenges me because some of the songs are sung in um, Amharic and Tigrinya. And I definitely don't speak those languages. I wish I did. Um, I speak very like broken, you know, most, even, even in the recording, like I pronounced something wrong in my Musa song. Mm-hmm. And I, every time I hear it, I'm like, ah, I just know there's like somebody who speaks to Grinya out there who's like fake, like, you know, and I'm just like, please, I'm trying, I'm trying to connect, you know? So, which I think is actually like better than not trying at all, so. Yeah. And which is fine, which is why I'm not like, which is why I didn't re-record it or whatever. I just say, like, yeah, I messed up, but that's because I came here when I was four and I assimilated to Canadian culture because in the 80s, being from Africa was not the look because everybody, everything on the commercials were like starving Africans with the flies. And that's all anybody knew. Anybody who I interacted with was like, oh, you're from Africa? how come you're not starving? It was just like, what? How come you speak English? It's like, I went to a British school in Kenya. What are you talking about? Like, I don't understand, (laughs) like, you know? So my whole life was like that struggle of like assimilating to Canadian culture and not being known as other um, outside of the, or my, like the Habesha community or whatever. And then when I had the chance for this album, I was like, no, I, I need to stand proud in who I am. And also, Um, because I know that words have power and names have power. I was like, it's important to honor the names of the, of my family members, of my ancestors that came before me. And, you know, meaning my, my, my grandparents on both sides, my, my parents, my sister, my son. And then on the remix album, I have a song, um, that is about a, a guardian angel as well. And I, you know, when I was writing all the music, a lot of it, uh, or before I was writing all the music, everything I was doing was just trying to figure out my um, family tree, trying to break down, like, I always say I'm Ethiopian and Eritrean, but what does that actually mean? Because Eritrea has nine uh, different ethnicities, Ethiopia has over 90. So what are you actually saying when you say Ethiopia, Eritrea? Like, break it down, like, who are you really? Um, what is what is the connection, you know? So um, it was more of a like a, a healing thing for me, the album. Um, and then, of course, my my wife is my producer because, as a female in 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 music, um, it was really really hard to get beats, like really hard. That it it was like you know come to the studio, listen to my beats, like. I don't know if I feel safe to do, there are like a very small amount of guys that I feel uh, comfortable with that I know it's not like a sex thing or like anything. Like it's just, yo, that's my friend. I feel so comfortable to go there. The the minute, like the smallest amount. Um, And so at the beginning it was really hard to get any music. And I told Sun Sun what, what I was looking for and she taught herself how to do it. She was like, okay. I'm going to teach myself how to do this for you because we're a team and and also I don't want you to feel uncomfortable, you know, like she makes jokes where she, like we're recording and she'll like light a candle and be like, is this too romantic? And I'm like, for, it's OK, you're my wife, <laughs> like, but like, you know, it's fine. But yeah, the process of that album was really like take it day by day, working on myself, on my history, connecting with my past, understanding the complexities of Ethiopian, Eritrea, even till now to this day, um, and hoping that by challenging myself that people would hear it and accept me, uh, um, and 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 they did. No, and when we when I got on Polaris on the shortlist, I was like, I cried because I was like, I can't believe this thing that I did for myself, not for this. Of course, I was like, I hope, but I was I didn't do it for it, you know. Um, so to get that recognition and uh, really was like, wow, I, I can sing about myself and I can um, be true to my past and my and my heritage and not um, not feel like I'm not being heard, which I don't think that would have been the same if I had released it in 2017 when I had originally wanted to or even when I started in 2009. I, I feel like the scene has changed a lot. And the world has changed a lot with with what they consider valuable. 
um, I mean, black art is always valuable, but it, it's really like who's actually seeing the value has now expanded. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dorje, do you want to speak to um, being a country musician in in a genre that typically doesn't celebrate their black artists? It's very few, and um, the attitude towards country music is is sometimes a little bit rude. You know, um, how how have you navigated through with your collaborators for your album? Uh, it's been a full and complex journey, <laughs> to, to say the least. Um, you know, I, I think that I, I really had to, I mean, before I even could outwardly say that I wanted to make country music, I did convince myself internally that that was okay to say that, like the songs that I was writing um, and how they like were like, you know, when I'm just like, playing them and singing them I'm like, man, like, yeah, this is, this is country. Like, this is, this is what it is to me. And, um, you know, even when I was able to actually express to like people close to me in my life that I, I wanted to explore being a musician, um, you know, like there was an automatic assumption of what kind of music I would be making, um, you know, and, and obviously, uh, you know, soul, R and B, hip hop, something along those lines, and and so that that's always kind of been like this added layer. Like I, I feel like I perpetually have to justify like why I make country music. Like, and you know, it's on. I would say the majority of people, it's not like a malicious thing, but it's like a thing. So it's like, you know, every almost every interview, it's just like that'll be like the first question. So like, why country music? Like. Um, you know, it, it's just like a, a, a shocking thing. And I mean, I, I feel like that in itself, I understand the intention, but like the impact of like those microaggressions over and over and over again, like they, they really do chip away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I personally just kind of started unpacking like all of my racial trauma, like maybe about five or six years ago. And, uh, you know, I'm almost 40 years old now and that that whole piece kind of leading into then starting to to make music um you know and educating myself along the way of like fully feeling empowered to speak my feelings because i feel you know similar to uh Roly, like you know these are things like we've always, i've always known that i've been living obviously but like I, my experience, my frame of reference for the most part is I'm always around white people. So like how, like, where has there ever been that safe space to just be like, Hey, like, can you not make that comment about my hair? Can you like not do this? Or like, you know, to level um, experiences I've had where I literally didn't feel safe. Like my physical safety was threatened and really aggressively and violently um, simply from being black. So I think that that, that's a, a big part of, what I think set me up to at least be able to navigate being black in country music, being queer in country music, being fat in country music, like et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, being neurodivergent in country music. Um, you know, and it, it has been just like a, there's been some great things that have happened. Um, you know, I released an EP in 2019, like three songs, and I really relate uh, to which profit of like, that was just like, for me, like, I just had to prove that I could do it, you know, for myself. And I remember leading up to that, having a conversation with my cousin of literally saying like, I will die if I don't do this. Like, I feel like I'm dying inside. I can feel it. And um, that was really incredible. And, you know, I was still super new. I like, I had this EP, they were really great uh, tracks. And like, I did what I could with them. Like what I knew, you know, sent them to some local radio stations, et cetera, tried to like, whichever. And, you know, nobody gave a shit, which is fine. Like <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, I'm new and, and whichever, like um, even then I didn't, I, I don't think I like really read too, too much into it of why maybe like people don't care. And um, then I was able to secure funding to like do a whole album. And uh, this was like the end of 2019. <laughs> um, leading into to 2020 and, and then pandemic. And then, I mean, George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery's murders, um, I call that era racism 2020, because it was like, 
this whole thing. And then like there was all of a sudden this like real interest in like black people doing country music. And, right? Like, yeah, that, that, that moment. And it's wild also too, because, you know, I, I feel like linear time is often this thing that is like weaponized against us. So, like in general, I think in life of like, I'm running out of time. I don't have enough time. And, you know, I always felt like I just, I waited too long. Like I didn't start this soon enough. Like, God, like, you know, <laughs> I'm old. Like I feel old. I'm tired. I've lived like really, you know, I've had like really full life experience in general. And uh, yeah, but the timing, I guess that's when that needed to hit. And I had written the song New Kind of Outlaw um, just kind of like right around that time. And I didn't think I was gonna record it. I literally just like, I wrote it, like I was like rapping to the air. Like I just like was punching the air and I was just so frustrated. I like had just gotten more feedback about how like I can never be in considered mainstream country music. I am never gonna, you know, be in this and that and blah, 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 blah. And there's all these rules to like, if you wanna do that. And, uh, and I was really scared. My like producer, thank goodness, like encouraged me to record that song. Um, you know, the last line in that song is uh, country music is black. Um, and like with like a full throat punch belt. And, um, you know, it was cathartic to record, but it was really scary to like put out there. And, and actually it took me months to feel comfortable to perform it live. Um, there was a couple times where I actually just didn't, like I just dropped the song. Um, and because like my audiences are also like white. <laughs> And uh, so that really, you know, made me feel not safe a lot of the times. And it's really cool because um, most recently this month, like I opened with that song now, which is like a, a really cool journey that's happened for me. But uh, yeah, it, it's been a challenge. There's a lot of performative things that happen. You know, I carry with me all the time. I think about that, like the Amplify Melanated Voices that came after uh, George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. Um, so that's like when people started to like, you know, take notice and like, it's grateful. It's, uh, it's cool that we're having these conversations and like, yeah, like now, you know, a lot of artists, there's a lot of black people making country music also. Like that's also a, a misconception that there isn't, there are, I would say the majority of them would be in the U S and, and, and abroad. Um, it's a little bit different here. Um, but that all being said, yeah, like it, it, it's just been uh, a really intense process and I am grateful for the exposure, but like also at the same time, and I will also speak that at the shows of like, man, it's been cool, like Rolling Stone and da, 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 and whichever, but like nobody did really care, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, previous to like these men being murdered in cold blood and like, we all just were, we all just watched it. And then, you know, mm -hmm. so that's a really complex thing to carry i think uh through this process and i'm someone that is is really adamant and committed to regardless of kind of what unfolds for me as an like as an, an independent like solo act like in general of just building and creating community here because there are like tons of bipoc and 2s lgbtq plus folks that want to be a part of country music whether that's to create it or to consume it um, like I said before, like we, you know, we learn how to line dance too in, in, in school and uh, it was really profound. Uh, uh, a friend of mine had said like, like, I don't feel safe to go to Cook County Saloon and go line dance, but like, I love to line dance, but you know, still in like 2022, you know, I don't feel safe to like go there. And um, yeah, that's been a big part of it, but it, it's been isolating for sure there. I have, um, three other uh, racialized people in my band, which is like really cool and kind of unheard of, like in this province for sure of um, doing that type of music. Um, my, most of my peers are obviously white and, and cisgendered and, and, and straight and, and it's everybody's nice, but like, yeah, I think a lot of people say they wanna help and they wanna be a part of the change and bringing equity, but like it, it kind of ends there and so the last year has been a lot of hand holding and a lot of calling in and a lot of calling out and a lot of I don't know if I can swear on this, but like a lot of bullshit and and I've burnt some bridges. Like for real, I have burnt some bridges um simply just because like 
I, I just can't play that game. It's really toxic. It's really gross behind the scenes. There's a lot of gatekeeping. And most of the artists, in particular in this region, like they all hire the same people. They all, they all go that same route. And for me to even step into those waters, which I did try, you know, but I tried like doing that without me, I'm not gonna change my sound. Like this is how my country music sounds and it should be commercially viable. And it should be given those same platforms as that white dude who is sampling hip hop tracks and is, you know, on the billboard number one charts for weeks as, as a country musician. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's just that like, and, and the feedback is there, like, you know, just what my sound is vocally, how I sound, certainly my lyrical content. I was told that like my, my lyrics are too cerebral for the, um, mainstream country music listener, um, which is like super weird and doesn't track with like what their demographics are and what my demographics are like statistically, if you pulled like, you know, my streaming reports and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's been a full and complex journey. There's been a lot of cool things. I did not expect to, um, for my album to be received how it was, certainly not for like a first kick at the can um and i will acknowledge even though i believe that my art belongs you know I, I i love my album i love my project i'm really proud of it um but you know a lot of that the exposure came because of the intersections that i also live at mm -hmm. yeah. georgia i want to kind of play off um that last point that you made and, and kind of hear from y'all about this because Obviously we're talking about black history and art, um, but we are living in a very historical moment right now. And, you know, the last couple of years have been crazy. And obviously we're in this, you know, global historic moment. And I'm curious to kind of get your thoughts on this because, you know, Georgia, you made a really great point about all of a sudden, you know, this, this spotlight and this interest that everybody has on, you know, on black art and, um, yeah, I'm curious to get your thoughts. Do we feel that this is a sustainable shift? Do we feel that, that something is happening or is this simply a moment? Um, anyone just feel free to jump in. Yeah, um, if, if, if I can just jump in, like, um, yeah, I felt like you had a lot of really good points before. Um, the first thing that made me think of is that in this era that we're in now, it's like we can be ourselves without having to compromise, you know, and that's not like um, a luxury that people in like the previous generations of Black Canadian music have, have always had, you know. And um, I feel like, you know, just the fact, you know, we're even doing the this kind of panel or like, you know, it's like we're having the, this kind of a platform. I think it is very powerful, but it's important to really make sure it's uh, done the right way and it's not in this uh, kind of tokenizing way that I've, I've experienced a lot in, uh, in Canadian music, you know, especially coming from, from Edmonton to just like being, I, I was a part of, you know, the local rap scene there, which was a, a little more multicultural, but um, I was also involved in like kind of the indie kind of electronic scene and stuff. And I remember some of the things that I would experience, like, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I used to, I, I tried to get signed to any local label and just like nobody wanted to sign me. Like no, nobody got it. You know, people didn't, had never heard rap music, you know, like anything. Like they hadn't even heard like 50 Cent or something, you know? So it was like, <laughs> it was, it was really like an uphill battle. Like every time like I met someone, I had to just like explain who I am and like what I do. And it's like, yeah, I make rap, but you know, and they'd be like, rap is crap. And I'd be like, no, no, no. It's like, I rap about, you know, there's there's all these different kinds of rap and there's like subgenres within it, blah, blah, blah. And having to explain this, it was definitely like very exhausting. And mm -hmm. I, there's one moment I always think of. Um, I tried to start a band with like some, some of these like kind of indie rock people. And I was talking to this guy to, about playing bass in a band and stuff. And he was just like, he's like, yeah, like, what are you going to play in the band? Are you going to play the computer? Mm -hmm. You know, and this was like back in like, you know, the early 2000s or whatever. And it's like, I used to just make beats on my computer and stuff. And that, that was very novel at the time. It was very weird, right? And uh, he was, and then he was like, you're gonna play like a, the computer keyboard, like it's a, like a guitar. And he was like, really like making fun of me or whatever. And it's like, you know, he's actually out of music now. He's, he's washed up. And um, 
now every show you go to has a computer. Go figure. <laughs> yep. I don't know, but I, I, I just, I just feel like you know that I, I was, I definitely had a lot of experiences like that where people just really didn't take me seriously, especially in Alberta for a really long time. And it's just nice to see things, you know, if things are getting more respectful, more, more, um, more diverse in a, in a really nice way. Mm -hmm. Has um, um, how you communicate with your audience has changed. Um, you are all somewhat self-managed. Um, let's talk about that process. Um, how are you feeling, you know, being in control of your music, being in control of saying, I'm the one that's going to send out the records. I'm the one that's going to send out the CDs. Like you guys are really working hard to make this happen in a in a in a situation where most people have managers and they have a team behind them. Um, talk to us about independently pushing forward. Brendan, you, you you're oh, oh yeah. sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Brendan. Go ahead. Well. <clears throat> I mean, I'm happy that I'm actually not doing so much of that anymore because it's a lot of work and sometimes it sucks. So, but I mean, it is a lot of work, right? I think um, what we're doing, whether we like it or not, a lot of the time is more of a labor of love than anything else, right? So, but it helps to have a team, in my opinion. So, although I know, like, I think Wish Prophet, you're, you've been like fully under your own control forever, right? So perhaps you have a different, a different take, and you know, on control. Yeah, I, I like, I just got a manager, like it, okay. not even six months ago. Um, I'm signed to my own label. I, I have a co-publishing deal, but that was literally done around the same time, just a few, just a few months before the manager. Um, yeah, I've done everything myself <laughs> and I hated it. <laughs> it was like, when do I get time to be creative? Like, uh, there people get paid to do this. Like people get salaries, people get actual money to do this. So why, um, you know, it is a labor of love, but sometimes uh, burnout is real and, um, you can't do everything yourself. And, you know, Although I do, I do, I would never um, be like, here's my master's because, you know, I, I just know where that's going. But like, um, because I'm able to be my own label, I, I do, we do box up all the merch and do that. But again, I hate doing it. Like I get so excited when people buy my record sold out. I like just printed a couple, like um, just under a hundred and um, posted them online and they sold out. And I was so excited at first. And then I was like, I gotta get all the boxes. I gotta figure out um, a system where I'm actually like printing out the labels. So I went and got like one of those like label printers, like I'm spending money to do this. Whereas a lot of other people are like, oh, I just sent it to the, the person who does the merch and I don't even have to deal anything with it. And, and at one, you know, at, at in one way, that's great. But in another, I, I'm also like, I have an issue with trusting people. So I need to see exactly what the hell is going on, especially when it comes to money and when it comes to my product. So, you know, it's a it's a double edged sword where I'm like, I love having a manager in this, but I'm also like, can I see all your notes? Can I see everything that we've talked about? I need to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, but yeah, but also it's like amazing that I'm able I'm even able to do this like 10 years ago. I remember trying to be like, how do we get our songs on iTunes? Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, you pay $20 a month for a distribution. Don't let anybody fool you. They're doing the same thing. Like, you know, like they have, most distribution companies will have like ins for like playlists and stuff like that. But if it's really just about like, how do I distribute my own music? That's so accessible now. Anybody can do it, you know. Um, that's it, like to go back to your last question about like have things changed for the better like it, it has in a way because it allows it allows anybody to be their own boss you don't need money you don't need it it's it's fantastic when you get it because it <laughs> relieves a lot of stress 
um, but you don't need it. So, and you don't need a team, but it's great when you have them because just like anything else, like you write a grant, you're asking for money, you're talking to people for things. They'll always be like, well, who else are you working with? You know, it's, it's all, it's a game. Everything's a game and people want to know who's, who's, who's on your team. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, of two minds about this. And this is something I'm, I'm very involved with because my, I just recently also got a manager relatively recently, but um, up until then I was self-managed for like nearly a decade, basically. Um, and, you know, obviously I, I still do a lot of stuff myself. Like I'm still packaging records and mailing them out myself. Like I really got into shipping. Like I know how to do the cheapest shipping possible and I've become an expert and all that, you know, um, which is cool. It's cool to learn every aspect of what you do, but it also takes up a lot of time, you know, like I do all this admin stuff that I wish I didn't have to do, but it's like, you know, but it was like, again, it's a part of not trusting because I had like a really horrible management situation where they like really like exploited my art mm -hmm. and it made it really hard to trust people. And so that's why I was like, I'll produce the album myself. I write everything. I like, you know, like I'm self-managed. I'm going to do everything. Right. But here's the other side of that is that if you think about all the like real classic albums, like you think of like, you know, like a Stevie Wonder album or something or like Sly and the Family Stones, like you think they're packaging up their own fucking records? You know, you know what I mean? Like to make the level of the scale of like songs in the key of life, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it, it, we don't have those kind of budgets that they had back then, right? And that's why, you know, now when you sign a label deal, they just try and, um, you know, like offload all the labor onto you, but then they still administer your masters for 10 years or whatever, and like, and they profit off of all the streams. And it's, you know, it's, it's it's a tricky game trying to like even just sign to an independent label nowadays, right? Because we don't have that Stevie Wonder budget from back in the day where I can get like an entire string section and like an orchestra and like all this stuff, you know? And so like, yeah, that's that's the thing is like now, you know, being a DIY artist, it's like I am in control of most of the means of production around what I'm doing, uh, which is great. And it's like, usually the more control I have, the better things go, as we can see with the Polaris Prize win here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But I can't help but wonder what I could achieve if I had even more uh, institutional support, you know? And, you know, I think it's all about keeping a balance. Like, I love seeing a lot of the new artists, like young artists now, like just totally skipping over the idea of like signing with a label and just, you know, realizing that really what you need is uh, PR. You need PR, you need like uh, distribution. You need just like, you know, it's easy to find out like the, the, the you know, it's, you, it's easy to get your own record press. Like anyone can do it, but it's like these inst institutions and labels and stuff, they try to make you feel like you, you can't do anything without them. But it's like, I guess what I'm saying now is like, I've gotten to the point where I'm able to leverage some of the relationships that I have to get to where I don't need any institutional support and I can afford my own orchestra, you yeah. know? Yeah. Being in power. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, there's, uh, there's, uh, it says, uh, has, has of your sounds been ripped off or stolen? Um, and do you sample or borrow sounds in your own music? Um, speaking to black music being sampled so frequently and stolen. Um, what's your experience with this? Uh, I personally don't sample anything. I mean, Sun Sun uh, produces all my beats. We don't sample. We'll get artists to come in and play onto things. Um, also, a lot of the sounds that she uses are free, royalty free, licensing free. Um, I've never had my music per se stolen. Um, but I am now new into the NFT world. And um, um, there was like a website that had like posted up everybody's everybody's music a couple weeks ago. Like yeah. I was, I was like, am I in here? Like everybody was. Yeah, yeah, up I in was that, on there but too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like that's the only time I've ever been like, oh my God, somebody is blatantly trying to steal my music. Um, but otherwise, no, no. I wish I had money to pay for samples because there's a lot of samples that I'd be like, oh, I want to put that in 
but I know that it's not a like I, you can sample like hip hop. You can sample a track and post it out, but you can't make mu- money off of it. You mm-hmm. can't post it on a streaming service and make money. That's that's where you're gonna get in trouble. Um, but you can release a mixtape. I I had lots of mixtapes on like full J Dilla beats. Like that's not a sample. I stole the beat. <laughs> like, but it's free. Mm-hmm. It's up online for free. I'm not making money off of it. So yeah. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a, a balance. I mean, like the first stuff I did, uh, I used to sample when I, I I was using all like stolen programs and like ripped, like pirated, like Fruity Loops and stuff to make all my beats. Um, but nowadays I don't use any samples and it's like all live instrumentation or like primarily synth is what I focus on. Um, but yeah, I feel like um, definitely um, I have experienced being bitten or like, <laughs> you know, conceptually uh, ripped off in certain ways, you know, I mean, it's inevitable as a black artist, you know, it's like, it's th- the thing about the team, that's an interesting thing, because now the thing is, I've, you know, since I've won Polaris, it's like, everyone is trying to use my engineer now, everyone's <laughs> trying to use my mixing person, everyone's trying to use the same producers, you know, it's like, it's like, okay, okay, it's like, you know, it's not, it, you know, I, I see, I peep game, but, um, uh, I think uh, one thing about the sampling, though, and what uh, Witch Prophet was saying, I think is um, very hip hop. The whole idea of, you know, borrowing and, and sharing elements like that is a, a foundational piece of hip hop. You know, it's like, like yeah, obviously you know, there's a dubious legality to, you know, just like rapping over somebody else's music. But I think it's just like a foundational part of the art form. And I think an interesting thing about it, too, that I've I've experienced before is that Sometimes if you just hit people up, they'll be reasonable about it. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of a cool thing is like, if you explain and it's like, you're really heartfelt about it. And sometimes if you like write a letter, like literally like write this like <laughs> old ass artist, like a handwritten letter or something like, maybe they'll just do something where it's like, they won't charge you a bunch of money. You know, like it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, I, I personally don't, uh, or haven't explored sampling of other peeps music for, for what I'm doing. Um, you know, I kind of mentioned before that there is a, a huge amount of, uh, like influence in what is considered mainstream country music right now. What is like being played on commercial country radio and yeah, uh, there's a lot of, beats being made and, and used, and I'm sure sampled um, in, in that realm, but it, it's it's really by white artists for the for the most part. Um, so yeah, that's, but that's definitely a, a, a thing for sure. Like there's a lot of, uh, there's a good solid handful of, yeah, country rap artists who are white. I don't know, they wouldn't call themselves country rap, but um, yeah, they're definitely on, on that tip for sure. Uh, we have another question from the audience. Um, do each of you have inspirations that are outside of music? Um, example, books, writers, poets, painters. Who's 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 on the radar right now for art in your world? Um, well, I definitely have a lot, um, especially for my last record. You know, you know, I was doing a lot of reading. I think that was a big thing um, that inspired the album. Like. You know, Desmond Cole was a big influence on me. Um, you know, a lot of uh, black artists, you know. Um, you know, I, I watched actually a lot of stand-up comedy. That was a, that was actually a weird, uh, unexpected influence for me. Like uh, watching old, like, Richard Pryor specials and stuff and kind of seeing his way of um, creating these, like, really succinct um, commentary about race in a way that was humorous, but really incisive, you know? And that was like a big inspiration to me. Like I wanted to, uh, you know, really like truth and jest was like a big idea for me. So um, yeah, whether it's comedy, like visual art, obviously, you know, like Carrie James Marshall, like I'm, I'm always thinking about his work. Um, yeah, no, it's like everything uh, informs it for sure. Yeah, I definitely did a lot of uh, reading uh, when the pandemic uh, kicked off and have tried my best to find as much time to. I've been finally working my way through like Octavia, uh, pardon me, Octavia Butler's works. Um, 
which has been um, pretty wonderful to to have like time and space to really like sit and and digest her her offerings and you know um, there's definitely a lot of themes like that are playing out right now um, and uh, and one of her uh, uh, parable of the sower the talents uh, actually she mentions Edmonton in the book awesome. Oh, let me tell you, and it was, yo, know, like if you've read the books, then you like you know, and I mean, there's so much that is actually happening, you know, a uh, president exactly like Donald Trump, and even like the slogan "Make America Great Again" is in the book, and then <laughs> she mentioned um, a family member in Edmonton, and like me and my partner were like, "What is Octavia trying to tell us? Like, what's going to go down in Edmonton? Like, we're here right now." <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and, and also, uh, for me, um, I draw inspiration, uh, my partner is, is also an artist and, uh, they're incredibly inspiring. And, uh, I have a lot of black queer, uh, friends who are also creators and artists in, in this city. And, uh, they are constantly, uh, I inspiring me and, uh, and, and championing me and, and calling me out and, um, reminding me of, of what I'm really looking to to get out of this experience for for myself and you know for community just in general. So yeah, lots of inspiration in, in that. I'm currently um, working on my next album, which has me completely engulfed in the world of uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, the brain um, seizures. Uh, out of body experiences. Um, so, I mean, it's not music, but so my album, the next album I'm working on is, is a focus on that because I do suffer with seizures and I do have out of body experiences and uh, a lot of other things to go, that go with um, uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. But um, that has really been an inspiration to like uh, watch other people and um, like on YouTube or on TikTok other people who are going through things similar and 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 um, trying to connect the dots between um, the human brain and the human spirit. Um, so, I mean, I definitely was not into science or anything like that in school, but now I'm like, oh my God, I'm a brain surgeon because of the amount of like knowledge that I have in there. <laughs> It's not necessarily research. I don't want to say I'm researching, but I'm I'm definitely like um, engulfed in the world of of science and and medicine and and health right now. And that's a, that's a major inspiration. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. all all like visual art books, all those things. You know what I mean? The classics right. like Fanon and Said. You know what I mean? But then the new stuff too, like. Um, Thomas King, and I'm right now. I'm reading a book called Stolen City, which is essentially the. Um, it's by Owen Taves. I don't, mm -hmm. You might be familiar with his mother. His mother, Miriam, is quite a well-known Canadian author, um, and he's written a book which is essentially the history of, of Winnipeg and, the Prairie Central. I mean Canada to an extent, but Winnipeg and surrounding areas from. Um, you know, about using racial capitalism as the as the prison to dissect it through. Um, but yeah, visual art, books, other music, all that stuff. Um, we have an audience member who'd like to hear more about um, the influence of your grandmother's music um, on your work. I mean it's not that large frankly um my i mean my grandmother obviously was a huge influence on me in a lot of ways uh she had she wasn't you know doing too much music in the time that i knew her but i know that when she was younger she was quite an accomplished uh singer and i mean i'm, I'm guessing what they're referring to is you know she had recorded some records which i was looking for and i did find them and we did actually sample some of her of her playing with her mother. Um, so that's on the new record. Um, and yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, it wasn't 
something, you know, I wish I had a really deep story of how I was so inspired by my grandmother's music and stuff. Um, but, you know, I mean, she inspired me in, in many other ways. And it's just nice to, to be able to have something, you know, a connection to her, I guess, musically, since we're you know, both in that same thought plane, I guess. Yeah. Um, Roly, you have a book coming out in May. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, but before I mention that, uh, I actually wanted to say that uh, Witch Prophet, uh, Sun Sun, and I have some tracks that need to come out so, that are bangers. I'm just saying. Oh, um, my goodness. When we, did we yeah, Sun Sun that? always plays those tracks all the time. It's like, I, I love those tracks. Out. So good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but in the meantime, I uh, have written a book. It's a memoir and all about, you know, my life growing up in Edmonton, being a black artist in the Canadian music industry and just different aspects of things that have happened in my career. It's called Bedroom Rapper. It's coming out uh, May 31st on McClellan and Stewart, um, Penguin Random House Canada. And yeah, I'm really stoked. I can't wait for people to read it. You know, I feel like it's um, the idea that I would ever get to write a book that would be on that kind of platform in this country is really exciting. And I've got, I got some stuff to say, let's say. Love it. Um, I'm looking forward to the movie adaptation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I need to get that um, CBC check too. <laughs> the, yep. They need to make the, uh, the, the TV show. What's next in your world, Brendan? We're finishing up our second record, and um, yeah, that's like I'm flying to Toronto next week to spend a week in the studio doing arranging and vocals, and hopefully send it to mixing and mastering two weeks after that. And um, you know, it's been pushed back quite a bit, so I hope that this is going to be the end of it, and then we're going to see its release in you know probably this time, 2023, I imagine. Amazing. That's Which you know, block heater this weekend, yes. right? That's what's next. Play Saturday. And exactly. That's awesome. You and Cadence play on Saturday, which profit on Friday. Um, Dorje, we're hoping to hear from you soon. Where are you where are you going next? Uh oh, I'm uh I'm going nowhere. I'm um <laughs> taking uh a break actually. I um mm. I got COVID uh, over the holiday break mm -hmm. and uh, I am still navigating uh, symptoms of it, unfortunately. And it's impacted my voice. I don't know if you can hear the hoarseness, but it has been perpetually there. I had to uh, really push myself. There was some contracts this month that I've, I've had on the books for a while and uh, just pushed through for, for myself and my band. and you know, and as we have to do sometimes. And um, yeah, I had a bunch of things on the horizon and I literally over the last three weeks have been uh, clearing my plate right off. I uh, was supposed to have a, I have a chapbook series called Shit My Shaman Says. And uh, the next two album, or sorry, next two volumes were uh, supposed to come out in April as a like whole collection. Um, I just pulled the plug on that. <laughs> so I'm meeting with my publisher to pull the plug on that for a while. Uh, I was a part of uh, an artist development program called Project Wild here in Alberta. Um, it's 12 finalists. This is the last year that they're running it and top prize is $100,000. I just withdrew uh, from that. Uh, I know I'm just telling you what I'm, what I'm not doing, all these other things. Uh, <laughs> hey, we had that's a, 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 a US tour lined up uh, for the spring and I've also just pulled out of that. So I'm gonna rest. I'm getting married on Tuesday, which is really wow, exciting. Wow, amazing. And, Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Congratulations. And, uh, yes, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And uh, yeah, I'm just, honestly, I'm going to rest. This being sick took a lot. I've never been sick like this before in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very grateful, uh, you know, for, for modern medicine, because I think it would have been a lot worse for me. And, uh, and also, like, the last year and a half, this this trajectory, like I just kind of got thrown into the deep end as life likes to do with me in general. And so I just, I need time to really contemplate and integrate what happened. 
you over this last year and a half and I've uh, really I'm I'm just kind of in this place of letting go of old dreams and goals I had with mm. with being an artist with with my craft with you know what validation I need and do not need right. um you know and 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 all of that I just need time to do that and and to write and like the admin thing I mean mm. oh my god there's like the amount of times, and you know, I've run my own my own business for for ten years. The the music thing has been, you know, much more recent. And like, I'm just like, what? Like, how does anybody write music? Like, how is anyone doing anything other than that? So, um, yeah, there's just a there's just a lot for me to 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 process and to contemplate on. And so I'm gonna be here in Edmonton. Anybody's coming through, come on over. I'll cook you a meal because I'm gonna be chilling until the summertime. Amazing. Um, Witch Prophet, you're going to be touring. Um, but also, I kind of want to hear about your, like, you live on a farm. Yes. A really beautiful one. It looks amazing. Uh, oh, there we go. Sorry, my phone was dying, so I was trying to plug it at the same time as listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I moved out to a farm with, uh, with my wife in 2018. Um, actually we, we, we had a house in Toronto and, uh, we used to work, I used to work in construction. So we, we used to paint lines, the parking lot layouts. So that was our job for like a couple of years and we saved up money and uh, bought a house. Um, and then we both got really sick. And so we had to sell our house. Um, and then we tried to get back into the market with the money from the sold house, but we weren't working construction anymore. And I was like, no, I'm a full-time artist. And the bank was like, you're never getting back in here. So <laughs> we were like, how do we get, what is going on? How do we get back in the market? Um, and we searched and searched and searched and found an abandoned um, house that was um, on quite a few acres of land. And uh, when my wife took me there, it was it had been abandoned for like 20 years. A hole in the roof. There was like a dead um, fox, just the bones, curled <laughs> up in the living room. Um, which I wish now that I had saved that because like what an amazing gift. Um, but obviously the the people who came to clear out the house just threw everything out. Um, but yeah, we uh, we. She was like, do you see the potential? And I was like, I guess, I think so. <laughs> like we're surrounded by a forest. There's nobody around. It's really, it's really scary to be black or queer in rural Ontario. Um, um, but we did it and we moved there and we, um, we pretty much ran out of money doing the electrical and the plumbing and the roof. Um, no money to pay anybody to actually renovate the house. So we just learned everything off of YouTube and did it ourselves. Um, we're still building. Um, the, the bottom floor is going to be an artist residency when we do finish it, just so we can provide um, like just a, a, a natural space for people to come um, and work quietly or to just to experience nature because just being out there has completely changed my um, viewpoint of 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 winter in in specific, like specifically, I've always hated winter. I've never, I've always thought it was ugly, slush, dirty, pollution. Um, and then living out there, I was like, no, it's not the winter that's dirty. It's humans. <laughs> like it's not, it's not the nature. It's humans. <laughs> like and so, living there has been uh, a eye opening experience. Um, but it's definitely. Uh, a place full of magic and we're so I'm so grateful that we were able to be there while we're on the topic of future you know um uh Georgia you mentioned always kind of having to justify uh being in the country music space and you know Cadence Weapon you talked about people saying you know you're from Edmonton where is that uh, you know obviously a shift is happening in these spaces um but I do want to hear from y'all what you see for the future you know do you where do you think that your space and your industry and your place in in your industry um is going you know what how, where do you hope it's going? What do you see for the future? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely feel personally, I'm a very optimistic person. Like I feel very optimistic about the future. And I feel like, uh, especially just in Alberta and Edmonton, like, you know, I'm seeing a lot more, um, you know, I don't want to say, I guess, memorializing or just kind of like, uh, you know, maintaining the history of black music in Alberta, you know, with like a lot of stuff that um, Arlo Maverick is doing, you know, with um, some of his documentary series and just like the idea of um, just keeping the momentum going, you know? My future involves my cat coming <laughs> right into the uh, interview. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, Alberta, um, I definitely feel like, especially every time I go back, I, I, I'm so happy to be back because I feel like it's just getting more diverse and more, um, more progressive, especially just in the arts community, which is just getting bigger and bigger. I remember, you know, when I first came on the scene, it was like hella lonely you know yep. and it was yeah. like really um you know my 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 primary mem memories uh were getting yelled at by a guy in a truck <laughs> you know that was pretty much just every day you know yeah. um and now we're you know um i guess they're the trucks are still around but <laughs> like they're, they're just honking now they're, they're just <laughs> honking yeah and they're yelling freedom now. yes but, yes but yeah. we're we're it's, here too the new song yeah. we are here too. um i uh we i i love living here I, I i love my home i'm very passionate about um building uh you know a more inclusive and equitable uh, community um, and, and really centering around country and, and folk and, and roots music. Um, I'm actually working on um, right now a building that's going to be called All Y'all Co-op, um, which is going to be exactly that, is kind of just creating events and workshops and, and for there to be those types of explorations uh, in safe spaces. And um, I, I really, I, this over this last period of you know a year and a half, and uh, this artist development program that I was a part of until recently, um, you know we have to map out our career for the next like eighteen months and and beyond and and build a vision and um, that visioning uh, truly not. To, I hope this doesn't come off weird, but like you know what with profit you're describing is literally getting a piece of land out here and and for me to be able to move more into the songwriting and producing side of things um, but also there being like artist development um, and residents there and but me really wanting to yes still make my own music but like I just really see the kind of this whole around artist development like there's all these artist development programs like to be the best artist for capitalism like how do you win at capitalism as an artist and there's like all of these things but I, I you know I, I want to be able to apply uh, my, my shamanic practice and the facilitation I do in that world and I've done for a really long time um, and, and apply that to like now what I'm learning and understanding about the craft and the creation of, of music itself um, so that's definitely my future I, I want this to be a place on the map as opposed to like you know there's always like are you, whoa are you gonna go to Nashville you made it to Nashville I'm like that's just never been my holy grail. Like I'm not, I'm, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm interested in like putting this place on the map. And there are like, I know Roly, I'm sure you agree with this. Like there are so many creative people here, like the, the level of talent here in, in this province. And, and for me, Edmonton, I've really lucked out in that sense. Like I have been supported. Like I, you know, through funding from just the city and the province, you know, last year it, it was like a lot, like, almost to the tune of $50,000 I was able to like secure for funding and, and for all of that kind of stuff. So um, all of that also got injected back into the industry here of hiring musicians here, uh, people that live and, and work here. That I'm really, really, you know, I pressed records, but did that here in, in Edmonton as opposed to, no offense to Toronto, but simply just because even though it was more expensive to do here to keep that money here. Um, so that's what I want to be a part of is putting this region on the map um, mm -hmm. as kind of a place that's really doing really interesting, um, you know, things to evolve the understanding of country music, roots music, folk music, and in those genres. 
Um, Brendan, do you feel any pressure to move from Winnipeg? No pressure. Uh, I mean, it's like I've moved, I've come back, I've traveled quite a bit and like, it's always interesting. I think, you know, people think that, you know, it's so much better in other places, you know, and especially for like, maybe what, you know, what we're doing, like hip hop or any kind of like arm, like any kind of black music, frankly, you know what I'm saying? But like, and I would say that, you know, that's true in some of the major centers for those things, right? But like, even in going there, my experiences have been like, sometimes sometimes the party is full of like 500 or 1,000 people. Sometimes it's just 50 people also, you know what I mean? So like, I don't know that the grass is always greener, you know what I mean? I, like, I'm, obviously we can all recognize there's, you know, more opportunities and more, more better opportunities perhaps um, in other places, but like, I, you know, at the same time, I wonder like, are those consistent or they're just few and far between? Because I, I just look at the people that are doing similar things to what I'm doing in other places. And that's really it. Like they might get a good look or a few good looks, but like generally they're still like, they've got the weekly gig at the coffee shop or whatever. And like, there's like 10 people that come and like they have a DJ this and like, a, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like, like I said, it's, the grass isn't so, so green over there. Right. You know what I mean? So, but like, you know, there there might be a move in the in the near future coming up. So we'll see. Exciting. Um, Cadence, are you going to take the international waters, or are you going to stick it out in Toronto? Um, you know, I uh, I feel like the longer um, I've been in Toronto, the better things have been. Weirdly, mm -hmm. but I mean, for for me. Um, when I moved away from Edmonton, like I was actually doing doing perfectly fine in my career. It wasn't like I was like, oh, I have to leave Edmonton to like be more successful or something. Um, but it was really like I moved to Montreal and I just wanted to be around like a particular like style of music at the time and just kind of see if I could hang, you know, and just like being like in a particular artistic community. And it really challenged me and changed me as an artist. And then moving to Toronto, like, I feel like I learned more about just the music industry and just kind of seeing what was possible, like, on that side of things. And, you know, that's like, maybe I wouldn't uh, have, like, a book deal today if I didn't live here, you know, things like that. Um, but, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be... Well, I mean, I am going to L.A., like, tomorrow. Like, after the, after the show, <laughs> I'm, going, I'm, go I'm going to L.A. for a month uh, to record. But um, I don't think I'm going to be moving anywhere. You know, um, I, I like Canada. I like Toronto. I like Alberta. I like being here, you know, and I've, I really just feel so much momentum just for everything, not only that I'm doing, but everything I'm just seeing in the community and just feels good. Amazing. Witch Prophet, you are with us tomorrow. And um, what can we expect to hear? Can you guys hear me? Can hear me now? Yeah, okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I will be performing songs off of my DNA activation album, and I'll probably be doing a few new songs off of uh, the new album, which is called The Gateway Experience. So, um, yeah, bumping beats, uh, scary loops that might make you be like, ah, she's putting a spell on me. And I am. I am. <laughs> but not in a mean way, you know, like in a magical, nice way. So, yeah. Amazing. And Brendan, you're coming down with the with the band? Yes, I am. Yes, we've heard this is a magical electrifying experience. How would you describe this? How would I describe the show that you're going to see? Yes. A journey. A journey. <laughs> a journey uh, in, you know, in the the culture where uh, loops are slayed and jewels are the, the tools of the trade. Beautiful, beautiful. And really, you're gonna be giving us? Just straight heat, <laughs> block, a block heater. You know, I'm coming with beautiful. the heat, you know? Yes, I, I can't wait, I can't wait. I'm gonna give, give all my spirit. I can't <laughs> wait. Love it.
Absolutely love it. Um, so for everybody, uh, Block Heater runs through Sunday, February 20th. Um, you can see free performances by Shawnee Kish, Cadence Weapon, and more at Olympic Plaza Friday and Saturday evenings. And this is in conjunction with Chinook Blast, Glow, and Big. On Sunday afternoon and evening, there are two special shows at the Jackson Concert Hall with Ray Maid and Chantal Kraziavuk, Ruben in the Dark, Bobby Wazinski, Casey and Clayton, and more. And if you're looking for more information in regards to tickets, you can go to calgaryfolkfest.com. Um, we have sponsors to thank. I want to thank um, the artists. We want to thank Folkfest. We want to thank our funders and sponsors for helping bring Block Heater to life. ATB, the City of Calgary, the Canadian Heritage, Alberta Foundation for the Arts, Calgary Arts Development, Big Rock, CKUA Radio, CJSW Radio, the Michelle O'Reilly Foundation, and Chinook Blast. Um, any last words for the audience? What 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 do you leave us with? Pearls of wisdom for the future. Uh, I I don't necessarily have any pearls of wisdom. I just want to say uh, it was so lovely to be on this panel with all of you, and thank you for sharing uh, your your stories and uh, yeah, just your histories. It was just really. Uh, uh, lovely to be a part of in a great way. This is how I'm kicking off my sabbatical. I'm shutting down my social media tonight. Mm -hmm. This is the last thing. This was a beautiful thing to end on. So thank you for having me. Nice. Yes, uh, thank you uh, to Afros in the City, um, Calgary Folk Fest, and just all of you, everyone watching, everyone taking part in the panel. Um, and I can't wait to play on Saturday. Yeah, we can't wait to have you. This will be your first time um, performing in, in the in the festival. Yes. Um, my first time doing Block Heater, but I I have played Calgary Folk Fest um, once okay. in twenty twelve actually. Yeah. I hope you're playing this. Year. I hope you're all playing this year. Fingers crossed. Yeah, that'd be sick. That would be amazing because then we can get you all on stage because that's what Folk Fest is all about. It's about bringing all the artists together and they just do different things and jam off and rip off. So, um, which Prophet Brendan, what are your final words for us? Uh, my final words are thank you, of course, and uh, what I tell everybody. And, and I guess it's it's evening now. I mean. My body's telling me it's 10.30 at night. I'm like, it's bedtime, but it's 8.30 mm -hmm. here in Calgary. Oh but what I would say is if, if, I was, if I was home, I'd say uh, drink some water and make sure you write down your dreams in the morning. Oh, thank you. Brendan. Yo, know, just echo what everyone else has said. You know, thank you, you know, for asking me to be involved with this and for asking us to play this weekend. And uh, yeah. Hopefully, I can meet you all if I haven't met you already in the flesh yes. at some point in the near future. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. I will be your MC on Saturday. So I'm looking forward to experiencing. And I know Tommy will be checking out the show on Sunday, um, which Prophet, we wish you all the very best. Zorje, all the very best in your healing processes. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tommy. Um, thank you to the audience. There are just comments flying through saying that they love this. And um, yeah.